I appreciate you all coming. This is a very intimidating room, so uh, <laughs> I can't see any of you. It's blinding, and I'm very hard of hearing, so if you have questions, please speak up. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about what's new in HTTPD 2.4. Uh, we released the first version of this. The, the first release of 2.4 came out back in February, and the 2.4.4 release was pushed out yesterday. So if I refer to 2.4.3 as the latest version in these slides, that's because that just happened yesterday. Um, about seven and a half years ago in Stuttgart at ApacheCon, I gave a presentation called Why I Hate Apache. And I listed a bunch of reasons that, a bunch of things that really irritated me about the Apache web server. It was a very tongue-in-cheek talk. And uh, every single thing that I mentioned in that presentation has been addressed in the 2.4 release. So I'm going to go through some of those things. Unfortunately, having only 45 minutes, I don't actually have time to cover everything in depth. It's, it's a, a very compelling new release. If you have not yet upgraded to 2.4, I hope that by the end of this you'll be persuaded that it's the thing to do. So let's jump right in. Prior to 2.4, the MPM, the multi-processing module, was something that was very tightly bound up in how the build was done. And so if you wanted to switch from, say, a pre-fork MPM to a threaded MPM, you would have to reinstall the Apache server. Uh, there, are, there are several MPMs available. There's the pre-fork, which consists of a single parent and several multi, uh, single threaded processes. The worker MPM consists of multi-threaded processes. And the, the big change with MPMs in 2.4 is that now you can build MPMs as shared objects. You can then load the one that you want at configure time with a load module option like any other module. So this is a significant change because before you had to decide ahead of time which MPM you wanted. If you wanted to experiment with another one, it was quite a bit of hassle. Now it's just a line of configuration. There are, of course, certain directives that are MPM specific, and so uh, you do need to make sure that you actually test before you put it into production. It's not something that you can just throw out there and hope that it works. But it does give you the opportunity to, to switch between them as needed, or you can run multiple instances of the server on the same hardware pointing at different configurations using different MPMs. So that's very cool. The next feature that I have here is something that has been requested forever. And this is the ability to configure what your error log looks like and what information it logs. So previously, you had the error log directive. And it told the server where to put your error log. And that was the extent of the control that you had over that error log. Now we have an error log format directive that looks very much like the log format directive. Uh, you can put many of the same variables in it, as, and you, then you can also put in some that are specific to the error condition. So in the example that I've got here, the percent %m out at the end there is the, uh, the error message itself. In the default error log format, you'll have a percent lowercase m, which shows the module that was responsible for generating the error condition. And here's a really nice new feature is the percent capital L format. This allows you to correlate directly between an access log entry and the error log entry that was generated by it. So if you have a very busy site, you know that it's very difficult to figure out, looking at the error log, which access log entry went along with it. You can sort of correlate it by timestamp, but that's not good enough on an exceptionally busy site. So this gives you a log ID that you can tie those two entries directly together. Here's what a typical log entry looks like in the new format. 
This is the default format, and you can, of course, tweak this a little bit. Uh, you see that I've got the process ID that, that uh, generated the message. I've got the, the module that was reporting the message. In this case, it was core. And then you have the client address that generated the message. <clears throat> Stating which module is responsible for it brings me to the next feature that is really compelling in 2.4, and that is the per module log level configuration. So here's how log level used to work, and you, you specify the level at which, the verbosity level at which you wish to have your log file. And this can be anything from debug all the way down to, um, what's at the other end? I guess critical is at the other end of, this, of the spectrum. And um, you can set this globally. This can be set once in your configuration or per virtual host in 2.2 and earlier. Um, one of the downsides of this is if you want a greater verbosity on log messages for, say, mod include, then along for the ride you get a larger verbosity level for something like mod proxy, which just won't shut up. There's just so much debug information for mod proxy. And so um, this is something that has been improved in 2.4 in two ways. One is that you can specify log level per directory. And so in this configuration here, you can see that I've turned up the, the log level just for my CGI directory so I can get more information about what's going on there. But even more compelling is the ability to set log level per module. And in this example here, I've turned up the log level to warn on mod SSL, whereas it's only on info on everything else. <clears throat> Additionally, we've added several new log levels, and they are called trace1 through trace8, and this allows module author authors to provide really detailed debug trace information to you, the end user, so you can figure out exactly what's going on when something goes wrong. One of the side effects of this is that uh, the rewrite log uh, mod rewrite was one of the modules that provided its own uh, dedicated log file. They had a rewrite log directive. That directive has gone away and is replaced by this, uh, this per module configurable log level. If you want to pull out just the log messages relating to a particular module, you can simply pipe your log file through grep looking for a module name. <clears throat> now, to me, this next thing is, uh, from the server administrator's perspective, this is kind of the killer feature on 2.4. This is something that people have been requesting ever since I became involved with the Apache server project. People want some kind of configurable stuff in the Apache configuration file. Uh, there is a third-party module called mod macro that's provided something like this for a long time. And actually, I'll come back to mod macro a little bit later in this talk. Here is an example of using the if directive in your configuration file. And for anyone who's struggled with mod rewrite, isn't this better? You can simply have a, a, an if statement. And in this case, I'm saying, if somebody comes to my site using the hostname example.com, I want to require them to use www.example.com. It's legible. It's pretty clear just from looking at it what it means. And there aren't any nasty regular expressions floating around. Or, you know, the other way around, if I want to say, if it's not example.com, send it to example.com. Same thing, other direction. You can also have a, uh, a more detailed if-then-else structure in your configuration file. So I have 
in this case, I have uh, if, if the remote address, if the client address is in 10.1, then do this. Um, if it's somewhere else in 10. Dot, do this other thing. Otherwise, do this other thing. And that, that, goes, that gets evaluated at request time. Of course, there is some request time overhead involved with this. Uh, but you know you were already doing that with mod rewrite, so it's, it's not. It uh, improves the maintainability of your configuration. So the upshot of this is that I need to write a new edition of my book, which I am working on. In case you care, uh, but uh, mod rewrite is the bane of many system administrators, and uh, this is a much easier way to do some of those things. In addition to the if function having expression evaluation, there is also a general, general purpose expression parser that can be used in other directives. And uh, I think that this is the other killer feature, but I, I will mention once again that there is a request time overhead involved in using the expression parser. So one of the things that, that uh, was frustrating in earlier versions of the server was that there were several, several different syntaxes for these kinds of comparison expressions. The situation was worse in 1.3. There was some consolidation in the 2.0 days. And uh, there were two different species of regular expressions that you could use. And then there is also the sort of file glob foo.star syntax, which is actually still available in, in contexts where it makes sense. Um, as, a, as a module author, you can now use this general purpose expression evaluation engine instead of rolling your own. It is amazingly uh, flexible and it supports all manner of uh, logical expressions that you might want to put in a configuration directive. If you are interested in participating in documentation efforts, this is an area where we could use some help. We have a reference documentation on what the expression syntax looks like, but we're very light on actual examples of how you might use that in the real world. So if you do have examples of how you are using this, I'd love to talk to you to enhance that document. The expression engine can reference any variables that are accessible to the HTTPD runtime and use them, in a, in, use them at request time. So here's an example of using the expression engine to make sure that your website is only accessible during business hours. So we have require expression, and then we have an expression that says that the, the time hour needs to be greater than nine and less than 17, putting it within your, your normal business hours, and that directory will then be inaccessible outside of those hours. <clears throat> This is a much more minor change, it seems. However, spending a lot of time on the Apache HTTPD IRC channel, it's amazing how many people get this wrong. And so for years, people would get this, this configuration syntax wrong and we would beat them over the head with the documentation until finally someone said, why don't we just do it easier so they don't make this mistake? So here is the uh, the configuration example that's being talked about here, you have a name virtual host directive which says this interface, star colon 80, which means all IP addresses, port 80, requests over that interface should be treated as virtual host requests, and here are the virtual hosts that are configured for that interface. The trouble is that if you omit the name virtual host directive, or if you get the value, if the value in the name virtual host directive doesn't exactly match your virtual host blocks, then those virtual hosts might be ignored. Or you might get a warning message that says, you told me there were name virtual hosts on this interface, but there aren't. 
So I'm not going to run any of them. So um, why not just do the right thing if we already know what you meant? So here's, here's what you do now. The name virtual host directive, if you happen to put it in there, um, great. If you don't, we'll do what you meant, and these virtual hosts will work the way that you expected them to in the first place. So there, there's a number of things that, that are like this, things where um, we've, we've taken the addition, and I say we, and really it's several of the people that are sitting out there. I just write it down. Some of the people who actually do it are sitting in the audience here. And uh, they, they've taken some of the cases where people were frustrated with how things work, and they've made it work the way that it was expected to work. So that's great. This slide intentionally left blank. I don't know what that's about. So anyway, um, there are cases where we're still not quite sure what you meant. If there is overlap between two virtual hosts, say two virtual hosts have the same host name on them. Or maybe one of them has a wildcard host name that somehow is going to obscure another one with an overlapping host name, then we warn you about that at configuration time. We say, this, this overlaps, it probably won't do what you want, you might want to go check that. But we still try to do what we think you meant. Okay, um, override configuration. There is a feature in the web server called HT access files. This allows you to put a configuration file per directory. And the directive that permits this is allow override. And you can specify allow override none, don't allow HT access files. Allow override all, let people put whatever they want in HT access files. Or you can specify uh, categories, you can say, allow override options, and the options category encompasses several directives that people can put in the HT access file. And the case often happens when you want to allow people to override some things in a category, but not other things. Oh, one other thing, the default for allow override has changed. This is a very good thing. It used to be that allow override all was the default, and now it's allow override none. I expect that this broke some configurations out there, but I tend to think that this was a good thing because HD access files tend to be overused. So this will get people to look closer at their configuration. And Anyway, we've introduced this new directive called allow override list. So you can combine an out, allow override directive, in this case auth config, which allows uh, authentication and authorization type directives. And then I also want to allow people to use redirect and redirect match, but not the entire scope of things that are in that particular category. So I just add those specific ones. Moving on to the next thing that people have been asking for for 15 years. These are configuration file variables. Um, and like I said, you've been asking for this forever. So we've added the define directive that allows you to set the value of a variable and then use that elsewhere in your configuration files. Um, there are two different ways that you can use this, these variables. You can use the if defined direct, uh, directive, which has been around for a long time. The if defined directive allows you to put a block around the value of a variable. So we can say, um, I'm going to set the test variable to one, and if that variable is set, I want to run my test configuration. Otherwise, I want to run my standard configuration. You can define a variable like this either by setting a variable in your configuration file using the define directive, or you can set it at the command line when you start the server up by using httpd dash d test. The other thing that you can do is you can set a variable using define and then use it later on in a configuration directive. So I've got a define server name 
And then down at the bottom there, I'm using that server name variable in my document root. So if you look at the default configuration file now for 2.4, you'll see that we set the document root once in a defined directive, and then we use that several times later on, once in a directory block and once in the document root and uh, to, to eliminate the repetition there, so you only have to change that one place. And that looks like this in the default 2.4 configuration file. You set the document root once, and then it gets applied to all the other places that you may have overlooked in the past. All right, I think I was a little nervous there at the beginning because I'm not doing so well on pacing, but hopefully you'll have lots of questions, right? Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is Mod Heart Monitor. And um, this slide indicates that I was confused as to the schedule. Jim is going to be giving a talk about about proxy stuff in 2.4, and I presume he's gonna be talking a little bit about Mod Heart Monitor, right, Jim? Yes. Okay. So, in brief, Mod Heart Monitor is a way to monitor between, and if he wasn't before, he's hastily writing those slides now. <laughs> Mod Heart Monitor is a way to maintain a connection between a front-end proxy server and a back-end server that's being proxied to. So you have the heart monitor on the front end, you have the heartbeat on the back, and if the heart monitor ever ceases to hear the heartbeat, it takes that server out of the proxy rotation. And this gives you a way to bring servers up and down on the back end without affecting the end user's perception of, what, of the, the service. Speaking of talks that are coming up, there is a new module called ModLua and uh, I'm blinded by the lights. I think Daniel's here. Oh, Daniel stepped out for a moment. But uh, Mod Lua embeds a Lua, Lua interpreter in your Apache web server, much like Mod Perl or Mod Python, and it allows you to develop applications using Lua um, to run on HTTPD. And he's gonna be showing you some, some really cool stuff uh, tomorrow afternoon. Mod rate limit answers a question that we get, again, on the IRC channel all the time. People want to slow down the throughput for a particular part of their website. So the scenario here is I have a downloads directory, and people are downloading stuff so much from that directory that it's consuming all of my bandwidth, and the rest of my site is inaccessible. So mod... Uh, Mod rate limit addresses this, this issue, and it slows down the bandwidth consumption for that particular directory, in this case to 400 kilobits per second, so that the rest of my website does not suffer. In a couple hours, I'm gonna be talking at greater length about the access control changes in 2.4. Uh, the the uh, issue that was trying to be addressed here was that the old syntax using order and allow and deny and satisfy was incredibly confusing, but more importantly, it was, it was very limiting. It, it, it limited how fine-grained your access control could actually be. And the, the new syntax completely deals away, uh, it uh, does away with these old uh, configuration directives and replaces it with a handful of require directives. So here's a simple example that says, I want to either require somebody to use get, post, or options, or they've got to log in. So I'm going to require any, which means one or more of these conditions is sufficient, and then I state my require directives. Here's a slightly more complicated example, which says, I want to restrict access to this portion of my server based on um, the, the uh, LDAP groups that I've got set up, and I want them to either be a super, uh, super admin, or I want them to be either an administrator or in sales, 
and um, I don't want them to be a temporary employee. And I'm able, to, I'm able to say that kind of complicated scenario in this, which, you know, it's a little bit ugly when you look at it at first, but as you start breaking down into its component parts and understanding each one, it's fairly clear and also was not possible before with the kind of fine-grained accuracy that you have now. So I will be talking more about that at 4 p.m. If you're, if you're interested in the details. Everybody's favorite module, Mod Rewrite, has a few small tweaks to it. Um, there is a QSD flag that allows you to drop a query string. There's a new end flag that allows you to avoid looping in rewrite rules. Um, the, uh, the biggest change that is in, is in uh, Mod Rewrite is the ability to use SQL statements as part of a rewrite rule. So here's an example of, of using that. I've got a rewrite map that indicates, a, that specifies a SQL query. And the percent %s there is the requested URI, or whatever it is that I feed to it in my rewrite rule. And it does a database query, returns the response. You'll notice before the colon, there is the keyword fast DBD, and that indicates the type of rewrite map that's being defined. And there's two different ways to say this. One is by saying DBD, which does the database query at request time. And then there's fast DBD, which caches the result of that query. So that if you have data that's changing frequently, you want to do the request each time. If it doesn't change frequently, you want to cache it and you get an enormous performance improvement based on that. The rotate logs utility comes with the server in order to um, rotate your logs. So all of you have modern operating systems that rotate your logs as one of the system services. However, when you rotate your, lo your Apache server log files, you have to restart the HTTPD process to get it to start logging to the new log file. And sometimes that's not acceptable if the restart time is, is too much. So we provide this, uh, this rewrite logs utility that, um, that handles that for you as a piped log process. It can rotate your log files based on time or based on file size. And the syntax looks something like this. Um, that, that line, that's all one line uh, wrapped for the benefit of the slide. But uh, you have a custom log directive that points at a piped log handler called rotate logs. In this particular case, I'm rotating my log every 86,400 seconds, which is 24 hours. And the, uh, the dash L flag solves a problem that, that users of the rewrite logs, uh, I'm sorry, the rotate logs utility have had for a long time. And that is that you never are quite sure what your log file is called. In this case, uh, my command line there says, put my log file in var logs log file. But in reality, the log file is called log file dot Unix timestamp. So when I want to go and look at my log files, I'm not really sure what my log file's called until I look at the directory and find the latest one. It's a bit of a hassle. But the dash L flag is new in 2.4. It, it creates a hard symbolic link to the current log file, so I can just, uh, I, so I know what my log file is called, basically. The other enhancement to the rotate logs utility is the ability to invoke something when the log file is rotated using the dash p flag. If you have some sort of process that post, uh, post analyzes your log files, you can invoke that at the moment that you rotate your logs, for example.
Um, earlier, I mentioned Mod Macro. Mod Macro is one of those modules that when I, when I give uh, training classes, I, I invariably mention it as something that you should be using. It is a third-party module that allows you to put macros in your log file. And these macros are evaluated at startup time and allows you to create um, templatized configuration files. There we go. Um, just a month or so ago, a couple months ago, I guess, Mod Macro was donated to the web server project and is now part of Trunk. It's not yet in 2.4, is it? It's, no, so it's not in 2.4 yet. Hopefully it will be someday. Right now it's just in Trunk, so eventually it'll be in 2.6, but at some point perhaps it will be in 2.4. And Mod Macro is an amazingly powerful module, so that made me very happy. Here's an example of using Mod Macro. You define a macro with one or more variables, and then you, with the use directive, you invoke that macro and you feed it variables. So in this particular case, I'm creating a directory block that has a certain uh, authentication associated with it, and at, at server runtime, it'll take that macro block, it'll evaluate it, and it will generate these directory blocks. Now, someone pointed out to me yesterday that uh, this, this can cause significant overhead at startup time, so it's not, it's not a magic bullet. It is, in fact, generating a configuration which is then executed or evaluated and loaded. So, but, but still, it is a very cool module. And uh, that is pretty much the list of, of exciting new features in 2.4. There are other smaller things that I've probably neglected to mention, but uh, there you have it. Are, are there any, any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, there's the URL for the slides. They are not there right now. They will be there a few minutes after I stop talking. Yes. Um, is there going to be another talk? Sorry, I should just look on uh, on the event MPM. I thought that was actually the most compelling feature of 2.4. So uh, in 2.2 and earlier, the default MPM is pre-fork. And in 2.4 and later, the default MPM is determined based on your user, your operating system capabilities. And what that means in the real world is that the default MPM in 2.4 is usually event. Um, it's based on whether your operating system is able to handle polling and threads. And since most modern operating systems are, that means event is the default. There are still a few situations where you might want to use pre-fork. Uh, if you're running something that you're not sure about the thread safety of, you want to stick with pre-fork. But uh, the event MPM is much more scalable and quite a bit faster. So we're glad to have that out there as the default now. Yes? So can, can you say something about the, the gotchas from upgrading 2.2 to 2.4? Like, is there anything I need to worry about going from 2.2 to 2.4? Um, upgrading from 2.2 to 2.4 to can have some gotchas. Uh, we, we've tried to prevent some of the most obvious ones of that. Uh, the, the change in the authenticate or the access control system is the one that's most likely to catch people because it's a significant configuration change. And so there is a module called mod access compat which allows you to continue using the old syntax um, as you upgrade. What would you say other gotchas are? I mean, that, that seems like the most obvious one to me. Um, 
Yeah, so you'd need to check that third-party modules are, are still going to work for 2.4. Um, but uh, yeah, I think those would be the two biggest things. Yes? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Um, not sure that I have an answer for that. Jeff, you want to? I had a couple of questions. Oh, sorry. All right. Uh, we are recording the session, so if you could grab a microphone when you ask a question, that would be helpful. I can hear, but the mic, the speaker board can't. I've got a couple of quick questions. Um, first is uh, you mentioned de defining variables. Can you redefine those uh, sort of during parsing? So you, can you say my server name is this, do some things, now my server name is something else, or is that best done using macros? Yes, uh, so the question is, can you redefine a variable? And you can, and it gets, it gets used, the new value gets used from that point down. There's also a directive called, uh, I think it's undefine, that completely unsets a value. Okay, uh, also for the rewrite map where you can uh, execute a SQL query, yes. if you chose to cache that, is there a way to trigger a reload without doing uh, like a sig hop or something like that? Uh, no. In order to reload the cache, you would have to need to re restart this process. Okay. And finally, for uh, for the directory specific log level, are, is it possible, or the, are there any plans to support location based log level rather than directory? I think you can use that in location. So yeah, when when we talk in the documentation about directory, it also includes location. Uh, proxy, and, you know, a number of other sections. Files, that's the other one. So, yeah, that is already there. Okay. Hi. Um, a slightly odd question, but, you know, you showed us all these wonderful things that are in 2.4. We have lots of teams that are still running 2.2. When you guys are planning on end of life in 2.2, can I use that as to give these teams a kick in the pants to go ahead and upgrade beyond the obvious advantages that you have here? Hmm. Um, that kind of question tends to get a lot of debate when it comes up on the mailing list because we do have so many millions of sites that are still using 1.3. Um, and when we finally declared that we were end of life in 1.3, there were people that were anxious about that. Um, the discussion is currently ongoing on and off about whether to end of life 2.0. And so the 2.2 discussion, uh, you know, on the one hand, from my opinion, it can't come soon enough, but there are a lot of people that, that would be upset by that. The other side of that answer is that the HTTPD project is volunteer-based, and people work on whatever they want to. And if people want to keep working on 2.2 forever, nobody's going to tell them not to. But in reality, nobody's working on it anymore except for those few of us on the documentation team that are backporting docs patches. So in reality, it's sort of already end of life, but, but officially, it's still a product that, that we stand behind. Yes? Just a little add-on to that. We also have a couple of people uh, from distros who, who maintain packages. So those people are still invested in um, older this products, especially if those distros have long-term support, such as Rahel and Ubuntu. And on that note, let me answer a question that's been asked several times this week. Uh, Fedora, I believe, is the only Linux distribution that's currently shipping 2.4. So, so far as the Linux world goes, 2.2 is still the de facto version that unless you intentionally upgrade. The configuration file variables, uh, is that basically taking over the functionality of the third-party module mod define? 
You know, I don't know that I've ever used mod define, but based on the it, name, it, I would it, say it's, yes, it's, it's the same thing. It seems, from your examples, it seems that it is. Okay. And I'm curious about the interactions between that, which I guess is part of the core now. Yeah. And mod macro. Say, for example, uh, you define a macro that's got six variables, and when you invoke it, you only <laughs> specify the first three. Yeah. Would it draw the remaining three from anything that might have been defined as a configuration file variable? In other words, being able to set a bunch of defaults and then um, only define the ones that are necessary for you. Obviously, the syntax requires it to be um, yeah. you know, positional, but. And there are, there are overlaps between it simply because they're using similar syntax. Right. I, um, I, I, no I noticed the syntax the, uh, is different from the mod defined syntax. Oh, okay. I think. But the syntax between this and mod macro are the same. Mod macro has conventions that you might want to follow. Right. If I can find that slide again. So mod macro has conventions that you put a dollar sign in front right. of it, but you don't have to. You can also put a dollar sign and curly braces around it, but you don't have to. And uh, I, what we're leaning towards recommending, I think what we recommend in the documentation is that you adhere to those, those uh, guidelines that are not requirements, but to differentiate between the two. But yeah, you can run into situations where you step on your own variables if you're not careful. Okay. So using the undefined is a good idea to, to drop a variable when you think it's going to go out of, when you're no longer needing it. So yesterday uh, we spoke about how it's sometimes more efficient to put uh, certain rewrite rules in a rewrite map. Um, but the, the disadvantages with the rewrite map, it may crash the instance upon a restart or um, when you push the new map file, Apache loads the rewrite yeah, I think map automatically. So how do you prevent like a typo or some kind of uh, syntax error from causing the Apache server to crash? with a rewrite map. Yeah, so the, the, the context in which I made that comment was specifically about using, I think, I'm trying to remember, I was talking about rewrite map using the, the PRG uh, syntax where you're invoking an external process to act as the rewrite map. But I suppose that the, the problem is, is broader than that if, if Not you Not even with PRG, just, just using regular text rewrite map or even maybe a SQL rewrite map. Yeah, rewrite map lets you reference a plain text file with a one-to-one -one mapping or it lets you reference an external program that can provide that mapping functionality. And it's in that latter case where you can end up in a situation where that, that external program has crapped out for whatever reason and the HTTP process doesn't notice and starts getting bogus data back from the nothing that's there. Um, I, I tend to not recommend using that feature on production servers. You know, use it as a, as a quick prototyping, a quick fix kind of thing before you have a real solution. Um, but I guess you could, you could maybe get into the same situation with the, with the DBD one if your database went away. Um, I'm not sure what would happen to those mapping queries. I'd have to try that. I, okay. So. I guess you need to monitor your database server pretty closely to, to prevent that kind of thing from happening. Yeah, but, but like even text errors in the, the text files, if you, is there any way to, to syntax check those, like a check config, would a check config check if, if, a, re, if a map file exists on this um, or? If you're using a text map file, then on startup, it's going to parse that file and uh, it's going to throw an error message on startup if the syntax is incorrect in that file. Right, but if you have like a cluster of Apache servers and you update the you text update file, the file locally and you push it out to production, yeah. the, the Apache process checks the disk, sees that the timestamp was updated and loads yeah. a new file, finds a syntax error and it might crash. So if there's any way to prevent that, that would be nice. So. No, I'm not aware of one other than being vigilant. Um, if, 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 you convert, if you convert that text file to a DBM and use a DBM instead, then that conversion process does syntax check the file. So that might be the best way to do that, and it gives you the added performance benefit of the DBM. Okay. 
All right. Any more questions? Great. Just one quick one. Um, are there performance benefits as far as a shorter code path to using if instead of mod rewrite? Because I see a lot of overlap in functionality. Um, you know, the performance is going to be comparable. The, the benefit is the, the, the maintenance efficiency, the ability to actually read what your configuration file says. Uh, there are cases where one or the other is going to be more efficient at runtime, but both of those things, the if statements are evaluated per request, so there is, there is some overhead there. Um, mod rewrite does some optimization like pre-compiling the regular expressions at startup, so there's a little bit more efficiency there, so you know, it, it, it very much depends on the specific scenario that you're using it for. Okay, so we're actually, uh, we plan to finish up here, I think, a quarter past, so we have some time. I'm sure you can catch up with Rich, so I'd like to thank Rich anyway for his presentation, and, and we have the next presentation on Tomcat at quarter past. So thank you, Rich. Thank you.